You are listening to By the Book, because if you don't look at the world through the Bible, you will never see it right. Welcome to episode 74 of By the Book. This is Alan Griffith, your host, and I'm excited today to talk about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. In just a a few days, we're going to celebrate on Resurrection Sunday, often referred to as Easter Sunday. I really believe the term Easter came from a heathen goddess, uh, Ishtar, Ishtar, and uh, somehow the we picked up on it. Of course, the the world has picked up uh, a lot of things and used them, uh, and then the church picked up on them. I often think of, for instance, um, sorry, I'm on a little tangent here, but but the term Sunday. We talk about Sunday. Well, Sunday, of course, to the heathen was Sun Day, the day of the sun. And Monday was Moon Day, the day of the moon. And the Jews always talked about the days of the week as the first day, second day, third day, fourth day, etc. The Lord Jesus was resurrected on the first day of the week. So we're just a couple of days away from rejoicing in that incredible truth. And I want to talk to you from John 21. If you have your Bible, and I realize you may not, it might be on the road, but if you have your Bible, you can open to John 21. And we're not going to talk directly about the resurrection experience of the Lord Jesus, but what I would call the impact that that should have on us. And I'm not sure it has the impact on any of us, including myself, that it should. Let me read to you just. Uh, couple of verses from John 21, and then we'll kind of set the, the stage for where we are when this event takes place. John 21 begins with these words, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas, called Didymus, and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, that would be James and John, and two other of his disciples. Now, that's verses 1 and 2. And you'll notice that John says that the Lord Jesus showed himself again to the disciples. The Lord Jesus showed himself quite a number of times to people after he had risen from the dead to demonstrate clearly he was alive. Right in John 20, just the previous chapter from where we are in John 21, we find the Lord Jesus uh, appeared to his disciples on the night of the resurrection. He then appeared to two disciples uh, on the Emmaus Road. In fact, it was actually the afternoon of that day, evidently. Then, eight days later, he came back, as we find in John chapter 20, verse 26. He appeared. We are told that he appeared in the mountain of Galilee, eventually, when he gave the Great Commission. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that at one point he appeared to over 500 brethren at one time. Then he says he appeared to James. Then he appeared to all the apostles. And then Paul says that finally the Lord Jesus appeared to him. So the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ had taken place. And at uh, this point, John chapter 21, the Lord Jesus is appearing to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. Now, the Sea of Tiberias is also the Sea of Galilee, and it takes different names because of whatever area you are identifying with. Uh, Tiberias was a large uh, Gentile city right on the sea, so sometimes it was called the Sea of Tiberias, Galilee, the the region 
uh, of Israel there, the Sea of Galilee, and uh, so on. So here are the disciples, and they're up at the Sea of Galilee. They had been there many times. Verse 2 says, identifying who was together, that the group included Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, James and John, and two other disciples. And Peter makes this statement. Now remember, he has already seen the resurrected Christ. And Simon Peter saith unto them. So here's Peter, often a spokesman, talking to these other disciples, all of whom had been fishermen. And Simon Peter says to them, I go a fishing. Now, as we study that statement, we are told that the significance of it was not that simply Peter had decided to go out and do some fishing. It seems rather that he was saying, I am going back to be a fisherman. Now, why he said that, I don't know. He had seen the resurrected Christ, and whether or not he understood what that should mean in his life, I don't know. But he makes that statement, I'm going back to be a fisherman. Now, what is amazing to me is that verse 3 goes on and says, they, that's the rest of them, they say unto him, we also go with thee. We're going to do that too. We are going back to be fishermen. They went forth, entered into a ship immediately. They went out fishing. And guess what? Well, if you have your Bible open, you know. That night, they caught nothing. I love that. Uh, I believe uh, our Lord has a measure of humor about him. And where these men are saying, you know, we're going to go back. These were professionals. We're going to go back and be fishermen again. And it's like the Lord Jesus said, that's what you think. You don't catch fish unless I let you catch fish, which probably is a good lesson for all of us. So they're fishing all night. They caught nothing. When the morning, verse 4, when the morning was now come, Jesus, the resurrected Christ, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Now, it might have been because they were uh, at a distance out in the sea. It, it may have been that their eyes were blinded by the Lord. We don't know, but there's the Lord Jesus on the shore. They see him, but they don't recognize who it is. Verse 5, Jesus saith unto them, he already knew the answer, children, have you any meat? In other words, he's saying, did you catch anything? And they answered him, no. Do you have any meat? Do you have any fish? No. Now, here comes a miracle. He said unto them, cast thy net on the right side of of the ship, and ye shall find. Now, amazingly, they did it. Amazingly, they they did it. They might have responded, look, we've been out all night. We're fishermen. We haven't caught anything. We're not going to do that. But, But they did it. It says, they cast therefore. And now, after fishing all night and catching nothing, now the verse says, they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. So all of a sudden, empty nets all night long, and now they cast the net. And by the way, you've probably seen that happen. They have these large, huge nets that they throw out into the water. They might be, oh, I don't know, 12, 15 feet uh, in length, another 12, 15 feet in in width. They throw it out, they let it sink, they gather it in, and uh, here they are now gathering in so many fish that they were not able to draw it in. Verse 7, 
Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, that would be John, he loved them all, but he had that special place in his heart for John. John, probably the youngest, maybe even yet a a teenager, maybe. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, he now recognizes. Maybe he recognized because of the miracle. Maybe he looked more carefully. But he said to Peter, it is the Lord. He said, it's the Lord. That's who that is out there. That's who it is on the shore. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked. Now, that doesn't mean he was naked with absolutely no clothes. He had his undergarments on. He did not have his typical clothing on. So he gathers that, he puts it on, and he casts himself into the sea. He jumps into the ocean or the the sea of Galilee, and he's going to make his way toward the Lord Jesus. Verse 8 says, the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were, uh, 200 cubits, that would be about 300 feet, and they're dragging the net with fishes. So evidently others gathered, and now they're trying to drag this net in loaded with fish, while Peter jumps in to the sea, and he's trying to make his way to the shore. As soon then, verse 9, as soon as, as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and laid and the fish laid thereon and bread. Lord Jesus had his own fish. And he had fish laying on these coals of fire. Now I want to say a word about that. You've perhaps heard this before. But the only other time in Scripture that I know of when a fire of coals is mentioned is when Peter was in the palace of Caiaphas. The fire was burning, the coal fire burning. The Lord Jesus is standing nearby. Peter is challenged with whether or not he knew Christ. And he said, I never knew him. I do not know him. And now here's the Lord Jesus. Peter comes up on the shore and there's a fire of coals. Verse 10, Jesus saith unto them, bring of the fish which you have now caught. Again, he already had his own fish cooking, (laughs) but he says to them, well, you bring the fish that you caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land. So he's helping the other disciples. They draw the net to land. They bring it up on the shore. It says it is full of great fishes in 150 and three for all there were so many yet was not the net broken. Amazingly, uh, the net did not break. They gather all these fish, pull them up onto the shore. Jesus saith unto them in verse 12, come and dine. Come on, let's have something to eat. None of the disciples durst ask him, who art thou? Now, again, this is the resurrected Christ. They realized who it was but they they didn't say anything. They didn't run to him and say, Lord, it's you. They didn't say, who art thou? Because they knew it was him. They knew it was the Lord. Verse uh, Verse 13, Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. So he now begins to distribute food to them. Verse 14, this is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples. After that, he was risen from the dead. So his disciples here gathered as a group, and now he is showing himself to them again since his resurrection. Now something happens. It is important for the story. It is important for Peter. I want to tell you it's important for you and for me. Verse 15 says, So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter. Now he's going to focus on Peter. Everybody else is there. But he looks at Peter and he said, Simon, 
son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? What or who are the these? Some would suggest that the these are the other disciples. I am personally convinced the these were the fish. Because Peter had made a declaration that he was going back to be a fisherman. His goal in life from now on was to bring in fish. And so the Lord Jesus says, Simon Peter, do you love me more than you love these fish? Are you really going to devote your life to fishing? Well, Peter responds. And I always feel bad in a sense when we have to go to the Greek language to pull out an important point. Uh, people feel like, well, you know, I couldn't see that because I, I don't know the Greek. I always encourage people who want to be students of the body, uh, Bible to, to get a Strong's Concordance, get a Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament words, be able to look up some words. I'd encourage you to do that. But we have to understand the, the Greek words here to get this message, and we cannot afford to miss the message. Here's Peter's response. We're still in verse 15. He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. So the Lord Jesus said, Do you love me more than these fish? And Peter responds, Lord, you know that I love you. The Lord Jesus said unto him, Feed my lambs. What was he saying? Well, I suggest to you he was saying, don't fish for fish. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. Minister to my people. Now, what's, what's going on here? Well, as you may know, there are a couple of different Greek words that are rendered love in our New Testament. And we have to see that in order to get the impact of this experience. And again, I'm, I'm sorry for that in a sense, but you and I have to get the impact of this. Now, one of the Greek words is the word agape. It's become a very familiar term, agape love. It is a term that speaks of not so much emotion. As a matter of fact, there's really no emotion in the term. It is a term that speaks of putting value on something or someone, and then in order to show how valuable that thing or that person is, you are willing to make sacrifice for it. We're challenged as men, if you're a man listening today, to love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, and that's that agape love. So what is that challenge to me as a husband? It's this, you place value on your wife and you sacrifice for her to show her every day how valuable she is to you. I try to live with, with that challenge. I'm sure I fail miserably many times, but that's my heart. It's the same love of God for the world. It's the John 3.16 love. God so loved the world. There's his declaration of value he puts on the world. And what did he do? He so loved the world that he gave. There's the sacrifice. He gave his only begotten son. What a testimony. Agape love. I love, I place value, and I sacrifice to show how valuable that thing or person is to me. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because there's another word for love that speaks of affection. It's a good word. It's a valid word. It's a valid experience. 
to have affection for someone. But there is a difference between those two terms, and there is a difference on how those terms are expressed. I can say to somebody, I love you, and that's the expression of of affection. Oh, I care for you. But when I say agape love, I love you, that's saying, I love you, I place value on you, and I'm going to sacrifice myself for you. Well, that's, that's a different experience. So how does that fit into verse 15? Well, it fits into verse 15 in this way. The love the Lord Jesus used, the word he used was agape. He's saying, Peter, do you love me? Do you put value on me? And are you willing to sacrifice for me more than the value you put on these fish and the sacrifice you're going to make for them. Which is it? What do you value most? Peter responds. He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. But Peter, as you may know, changes terms. He uses that term, phileo, I love a brotherly love, and affection. So the Lord Jesus says basically this, Peter, are you willing to love me in such a way that you would sacrifice for me? Will you put that much value on me? And Peter's response is, oh Lord, you know I have great affection for you. World of difference. Well, the Lord Jesus is not satisfied. Verse 16, he saith to him again the second time, Son of Jonas, lovest thou me? No, Peter, I'm not letting you off the hook. I'm asking you with agape love, do you love me with a love where you will so value me that you will sacrifice yourself for me? That's what I'm asking. Peter responds. He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And Peter uses phileo again. Peter says, Lord, you know that I have great affection for you. Let me tell you why that's important before we go on in this text. I'm not sure that all of us understand the difference between those two loves when it comes especially to the the experience of today's Christianity. Because there are a lot of people who want to express emotional affection for the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I love him. Oh, I love him so much. It's kind of like the pitter-patter of the heart. Oh, I love him so much. Well, again, that's a valid love. That's a good love, but that's not the love that God wants. God wants us to say, I love you, I place value on you, Lord, and I will sacrifice for you. That's the love of Christ that God is looking for in his people in the church. And the affection love, the the feeling love, can be very shallow. Well, Peter responds again, verse 16, uh, Lord, I love you. I have great feelings for you. The Lord Jesus said, Peter, feed my sheep. Peter, you're going to, Peter, you're going to, you sacrifice yourself for these fish. I want you to serve me. I want you to feed my lambs. I want you to feed my sheep. Verse 17, he saith unto him the third time. Now watch what happens. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And when the Lord Jesus says this, the text says that Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? Well, was was Peter grieved because the Lord Jesus came back a third time? 
Was that it? Like three times you're asking me. I'm I'm grieved by that. No, let me tell you what grieved Peter. Let me tell you what got hold of Peter. What got hold of Peter, what, what broke Peter at this point, is that the Lord Jesus, in asking him about his love, said to Peter, Peter, do you have that affection, that phileo love? Do you have that affection for me? Is that your love for me? Is that it? Is that all you can say? Is that the most that you can give? The Lord Jesus changed the word. Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? Because the third time he used the other word. And here's the tragedy for this moment in Peter's life. He said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. In essence, and he used that word phileo. So in essence, he was saying, Lord, you know all things. You know where I am. You know where I am. You know that at this point in my life, the most I can say to you is that I have great affection for you but I cannot at this point in my life respond and say that I place so much value on you, Lord, that I will sacrifice myself for you. Peter couldn't say that. Oh, my. He knew. He knew where he was. And he admitted where he was. But the Lord Jesus did not let him off the hook, as it were. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. No, Peter, I won't accept that the most you have for me is affection. I won't accept that. I want your life. I want you to serve me. I want you to sacrifice for me. And then the Lord Jesus makes a prophetic statement about Peter, because as you know, Peter came to the place where he was willing to sacrifice all for Christ, and that is exactly what happened to Peter. Tradition tells us, we don't have absolute record of it, but tradition tells us that Peter was crucified for Christ. And tradition says that he requested to be crucified upside down because he did not feel worthy to be sacrificed on the cross the same way the Lord Jesus was. Well, our Savior anticipated what was coming for Peter when he said in verse 18, these are the words of the Lord Jesus now to Peter. He said, verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, Thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldst. You know, Peter, when you were young, you, you know, you got you got dressed, you got yourself ready, and you went and you did whatever you wanted to do. You walked wherever you wanted to walk. But he went on and said, But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands for crucifixion. Thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldst not. And verse 19, John comments and says, This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, when the Lord Jesus had said that, He said unto Peter, follow me. Wow. You know what Peter did? Peter left fishing. He left everything behind to follow Christ. What else dare we do with our lives? than what God calls us to do. Some people are fishermen, and God wants them to be fishermen. And if that's what God wants for you, 
be a fisherman. Or it might be in business or politics or education. I don't know what it might be, but I do know this. It is absolutely necessary that every single one of us who claim the name of Christ be willing to sacrifice ourselves for Christ, to do whatever he wants us to do. And I don't know what that might be for you. I I am thrilled with what God has asked me to do. I'm so humbled by it. And God might want that for you. But the, the important thing is this. It's not what you do. It is that you do and know you're doing what God wants you to do with your life. And Peter had to say, I'll walk away from what I thought I wanted to do. And I will sacrifice all for my Savior. Now, why do they do that? Why do they do that? What's the bottom line of motivation for him? Let me tell you what it is. Resurrection. Christ was alive. He was not dead. He is not dead today. He is alive. He is the living Savior. He's coming back. What else is there but to surrender to him completely? God bless you.